Hello, everyone. Hi, it's Mark Holthy here again doing another spontaneous live Q&A. This time it's all about Canadian immigration generally. I did, um, I did my last live Q&A just two days ago on Tuesday, and there were so many people that had so many questions that it was impossible for me to get through them all. And if you go through the Facebook feed here on the Canadian Immigration Institute, you'll see that the video lasted, well, that live Q&A session lasted almost a, an hour and a half, which is longer than I intend to go today. But there are, um, there's lots to talk about. People have tons of questions. They don't know where to turn for information they can trust. And so that's what we're trying to do. I'm a Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher. And uh, I have my own law firm, Holthy Law. And we actually call it Holthy Immigration Law, but you can find it at HoltheLaw.com. And um, the sole purpose of these is to try to, to just put information out there that you guys can trust because there is so much misinformation out there. So I have today with me um, <clears throat> uh, my my current paralegal who's working towards getting his law degree here in Alberta, Igor. And uh, he, you will see as you interact with me, is working hard to get our various social media channels up. So we have an Instagram um, account now. We have uh, our, our firm Twitter. We're working on LinkedIn. We're working on a bunch of different things. And yes, you can't be everywhere. But when it comes to amplifying the message and getting what we're doing here in these live videos out to the world, uh, letting people know about our blog posts and everything, this is the way that we're able to do it. And uh, so thanks to social media, we can get those messages out and hopefully find you guys wherever you're comfortable consuming information. So when we go forward here, you can see I've got this amazing this amazing castle behind me. So the challenge I'm going to extend out to those who are tuning in live in just a little bit here. Um, I'm going to extend a little challenge that relates to this castle. So I'm not going to do it now until we have <clears throat> a bunch of people on and then I'll post the challenge. But uh, you got to make it a little bit fun, right? Many of us are quarantined or self-isolating in our homes. I have until Monday and then we're finally through it. Uh, it's been it will have been three weeks with my daughter coming home from school in the US and my son returning quite abruptly from Suriname in South America. We have been dutifully self isolating to make very sure that we're not a part of the problem. And I hope all of you are being safe, taking care as this COVID-19 is just vicious, just awful. And many of you who have elderly parents, you know, we're not as concerned about ourselves as much as we are for them because they are the ones that are vulnerable, those that are otherwise um, sick or afflicted with, uh, with weaker immune systems, and the elderly are the ones that are falling prey to this horrible virus. So I hope you're being safe in your country, wherever you are. In the comment section, those who are tuning in, make sure you post where you're tuning in from. I absolutely love to see where people are connecting from. Today, once again, is going to be a day where I'm gonna answer your live questions. So everybody that's tuning in now, I will do my very best to get through them. Don't post them yet though, okay? Because if you post them and before the time in which I say I'm gonna start answering, um, your question might get skipped and you won't have an opportunity to for me to get back to it. So make sure that you post right now where you're tuning in from so we can see that we're one big global community. And I also want you to um, share it. Let other people know that we're live. and through some of our various uh, social media channels, Igor has been doing a great job at letting people know that we are going live because this is not a traditional time. Usually I just do it on Tuesday and usually it's just focused on express entry. But because of everything that's happened and uh, my involvement with the national um, executive as the vice chair of our Canadian Bar Association's national immigration section, I have an opportunity to get updates and, and learn things uh, about what's happening on the immigration front here in Canada in light of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic that uh, I, I want to try to help people and share with information that they can trust. So that's why I do this. Now, with all of this being said, um, uh, let's jump onto the, the comment section here and just see everybody's been piling in. We've got a bunch of people that are tuning in. So as always, oh, Maximus says, hi, Mark. Good to see you. Good to see you, Maximus. See you. Ralph, as always, awesome to have you. Uh, Katamba's back, uh, Cece's back. All of my my good friends are all tuning in again. Uh, Masood is uh, says hello. <laughs> Ralph says Germany. You bet, Germany it is. That's right where this castle is. 
And maybe, Ralph, you've got an unfair advantage, but we'll wait and see. Okay, uh, Thota um, is here. Great to have you back. Um, Darko and uh, so Maximus is Lagos, Nigeria. Wonderful. Um, Bezad's Ottawa. Abishak is Toronto. Ronell Sherwood Park. And that's Alberta here, I'm assuming. The Sherwood Park I know. Um, uh, Sedant is India. Uh, then we've got um, Kumanan from India. Gauri is in the States, in the US. Uh, Masood's watching from Dubai. Sohel's from Bangladesh. We've got Fazia, India. Um, uh, Joda is India. And of course, Ralph, you are in Edmonton, my friend. Um, let's see here. DM is in BC. So great. Thanks, guys, for letting me know. We've got Callum. Hey, Callum, great to see you. He's uh, tuning in from Scotland. Awesome. Okay, guys. Well, I think we've given enough shout outs. We've got Hardik is in Swift Current in Saskatchewan. All right. So we'll, we'll stop that for now. Um, what I want to do is, uh, for those of you who are tuning in in different, some of the different channels, I'm just going to invite Igor to jump in with me here. And he's just going to talk a little bit about um, our Instagram page, which um, Instagram is something I'm not terribly familiar with. My kids and my wife are, but I'm not. And so fortunately, I've got Igor who can enlighten me on the uses of these other tools. And we also made, those who are watching this as a recording on the Canadian Immigration Institute, uh, the, the YouTube channel, we may very well start broadcasting live on the YouTube channel and just maybe that will be a better platform than Facebook. We'll just see. Personally, Facebook drives me freaking crazy because even my own staff member, Susan, yesterday had trouble finding this. So make sure you tag your friends because they may go to the site themselves, wonder where it is and can't find it. And so go out of your way to, to tag and uh, we'll see if that can help everybody who wants to see this and participate live to have the ability to do so. Those of you who are posting comments, hold off for a section for a second. Don't post the, the questions yet because we're not quite there. Um, uh, we're just going to show you a couple other things that we have going on where you can also go to find information. And remember, when we're posting things, what you'll find in our blog posts, in our express entry um, law, anything we do with express entry, whether it's in the private group or otherwise, anything we post, we always try to link back <clears throat> to the actual government source. So it's not, we're not like some of those outfits where they just post their own thoughts and don't give you any reference for where it comes from. We really try to provide an actual link back to the true source of the information so you know that you can trust it. But sometimes it's hard to find. And it's also important to note when sometimes it's outdated. And I'll show you that in a little bit too. But let me pull Igor in right now. I'm going to I'm gonna see if I can pull him in. Here we go. How are you doing, Igor? Safe Hi, I'm doing great. Excellent. Hi, all. Excellent. Uh, so... You guys know Igor has recently joined our firm. He's one of the more newer permanent residents to Canada, and you can watch past episodes to learn more about him and his story, which was crazy, unbelievable his story, but it ended very happily, which we're all super excited about. And, um, and so Igor has been getting a bunch of things set up that just I didn't really know anything about or how to do it. Like I said, I'm, I'm kind of a, a pretty poor social media marketer, I can produce content up the yin yang, but I can't figure out half of the time how best to promote it. So Igor has been awesome with that. <clears throat> so Igor, I'll stop talking. I'll let you say hello. And then uh, once you kind of introduce yourself a little bit, then I'll shift over and we'll, we'll share a screen and you can do the talking as we are reviewing the, um, uh, the actual Instagram page. Okay. Good. So hi all. We all hope that you stay safe and coronavirus has not impacted you or your family. Um, it's a terrible time and we hope that we stay in touch with everybody and answer your questions and help you to get to move to Canada in this terrible days right now. So to um, stay in touch with our clients and um, people who need help, uh, we try to create a social media page on Instagram, on Twitter, on every other platform that we can take our, uh, stretch our hands to. And we started with Twitter, uh, which I try to promote through Let's our Facebook. The screen here for us, Igor. So here's Twitter. <clears throat> yeah, you can keep talking. Yes. So um, we started with Twitter. Uh, we already have 43 uh, followers, but we intend to get much more uh, in the coming days. And Twitter is actually one of the platforms that we really heavily rely on. Uh, this is the platform where you can get like the most recent updates on any um, immigration matter, uh, uh, any um, 
you, you will you will get a chance to actually uh, find tips and um, links to the official sources uh, of information that you should rely on. Um, we post our blog posts. We repost pretty much all the information that we have at the moment to a Twitter account. Then we stretched our hands to Instagram. And on Instagram, we post visual content. Um, Instagram is also a reliable source of information that you can get in touch um, with our firm uh, through Instagram. You can uh, view our Instagram live stories. And actually, um, just recently, I created a live story notifying our subscribers about the upcoming live Q&A video that you can um, just see in your um, live story feeds. And you can also post your questions that you want to be considered during the live Q&A by Mark Holthy. So we highly encourage you to sign up and uh, follow us on Twitter and Instagram um, to stay up to date with the most recent updates. That's pretty much it. All right. Well, <clears throat> let's show them a few other things. So obviously this here's our Instagram. So definitely follow us on that and we'd, we'd love to reconnect with you back. Um, we also have revamped our Canadian Immigration Institute. And last episode, we talked a little bit about how we um, had this uh, all of our awesome courses. And then we, when we clicked on it, <laughs> the links didn't work. But that's OK. It's, it's all set up nice now and it's easy for you to follow. Those who are tuning in right now, um, <clears throat> for the express entry process, we have a course that's designed specifically to guide you through that whole process that's been around forever. And our coupon code for all of you is EEDIY50. And when you click apply on that, you get 50% off that, that access, that one-time access to the course. And when I say one-time, for this version of the Express Entry um, uh, course, this is where you're going to be able to access it unlimited, uh, this, this, uh, this current version. And then when we go back and we take a look, you can also choose to subscribe on a monthly basis if you like as well. So both of those options are there. Um, I've said repeatedly that we're working on courses, and, I, and we truly are. And if I'm not such a perfectionist, <clears throat> I'm sure we'd have a ton more released. But this is another resource for you. I also want to point out that those of you who haven't yet gone to our website, which is holthylaw.com, one of the most important sources on our website of information is the blogs that we post. And uh, we have two that were just released just recently. Um, Igor helped me to put together uh, the one related to those workers in Canada who are looking to try to claim employment insurance benefits. And this blog post here <clears throat> just gives you a little bit of an overview of what the, you know, what the requirements are. And the short answer is, yeah, if you're in Canada and you're on a work permit, you have the potential of qualifying for employment insurance if you've been laid off by your employer. And so you can take a look at that. There's going to be other ones that we're going to post on some of the emergency benefit provisions that are being applied. But you can see, once again, there's lots of links, direct links for you back to the sources of where we're getting all of this. So you definitely want to stay on top of our blog post. And then a shout out to Susan Wood, who now we've got her properly referenced here on the Canadian immigration and COVID-19 travel restrictions. Now, I want to show you guys just a couple things before we get into questions once again. So if you're posting comments, hold off, okay? And then we will get to those in just a little bit. This blog post um, that Susan put together has a bunch of links in it. And what I want you to pay close attention to <clears throat> are the dates that she has here. Because although she post posted this on March the 30th, some of the links back to the government sites, um, she's also made a point of indicating the date that they were last valid. So they could very well be updated. And in fact, these ones sh are, are pretty much outdated already. But if you look here, when you click on the link, the travel restriction measures, these there has been updates to this. But if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see, <clears throat> and this is what's important, this was as of March the 26th. So it's, it's this information, even on the government website, the program delivery instructions are not always as current as you can get them. And so for this reason, this is why I'm sharing what I'm sharing now. And understand everything that we're sharing right at this time, um, Igor and I and, and Susan, um, what you have to understand is that this information um, is valid as of this moment. You're hearing it. But in two seconds, in a minute, in you know half an hour, in a day, the information we're sharing could change. That's why it's so important to keep coming back and listening to, to get the most recent information uh, as we know it. Now, it might be possible that the government has something else in the works, but 
this is uh, this is why we're doing these more frequently and just shifting back to these. Always pay attention whenever you're going to these sites and all of these links are right in the blog post that uh, that Susan here wrote. So you can go check that out on our site. But all of these um, these uh, program delivery instructions, they are dated. And so if you're trying to rely on this one, understand that there may be more detailed information that's been released in the last week. So be aware of this. Now, I know they're trying their hardest to stay up to date and keep everything, you know, the most current as possible. But the reality is they're, they're just not able to do it yet. So we'll try to pass along everything we hear as we hear. Um, then, obviously, those who are unaware of it, we have our Express Entry Law private Facebook group. And we did a little test. And the test has confirmed that Facebook sucks. And in fact, when people are adding new people, Facebook is clearly dropping them off or not actually allowing me to register more than 125,000. So we have been at 124,000 for probably about two years and we've never ever surpassed that. So people are obviously dropping off as uh, new people are being added. And that's fine if they're not interested in the group. Um, I consider them the uh, graduates of the Canadian Immigration Institute. And, uh, and so I, I just love the fact that people are coming in cycling through. Um, I also want to give uh, a shout out to another platform that you guys just probably aren't aware of, which is the Canadian Immigration Podcast. And you can access this on iTunes um, uh, and you can, or you can go right to the, the site here and listen to it. I just released one just, well, it was probably about 1 a.m. this morning. Um, just some thoughts on what's going on with Canadian immigration and having worked in the trenches for over 15 years, just it's changed a lot. And I, I explain why it's so darn hard and unforgiving. And uh, I just put things into context a little bit for everyone who doesn't know the history behind our immigration programs and our immigration movements and all the political changes and just how it's all affected our system as it is today. And then last but not least, our awesome YouTube channel right here where we try to spin off and, and post all of these live videos as well that you can go through and you can consume all of this content that's here. And so uh, this is another uh, wonderful resource for you. I don't even know how many people are subscribing these days to this, um, to our little YouTube channel. Looks like there's about a little over 17,000. So it's growing, it's growing. All right, so that's basically it. So Igor, uh, we've zipped through some of the resources that we have available for people. Um, any last parting thoughts before I shift over and we start uh, answering questions from all of these amazing people who are watching live? Yeah, so um, as Mark already mentioned, um, just the updates and, and the regulations on Canadian immigration change within like an hour. So what you want to do is just to stay up to date with the most recent, the most valid uh, updates. And this is one of the ways to get in, um, get updated about what changes with Canadian immigration if you subscribe to our Instagram and Twitter page, because those are the sources that get updated the, the most and you'll get the most recent updates if you subscribe specifically to those um, sources of information. But also keep in mind that we have the website because the website gets updated pretty rapidly and frequently. So we highly encourage you to um, try to subscribe to those channels as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Igor. All right. Okay. So I'll just shift back here and I okay. um, want to thank Igor for jumping on. Okay. Now that we've got everybody in here, uh, I wanted to give everyone a fair opportunity to do this. So we've got just about a hundred people that are apparently watching live. So you find people that are watching live. I want to make it worth your while. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're looking for just a little piece of information, just a little nugget of information. And in order to wait for it, you have to be patient and listen to everybody else's questions. And I'm very mindful of that. And the thing that makes these worth doing is all of you coming out, watching, contributing, asking questions, because without the questions, there would just be me blithering on, um, just not really having a, <laughs> a very good dialogue that's enjoyable for you to listen to. So it's you guys that make this worthwhile. And so um, what I want to do is, and I haven't told Igor this, but um, what I want to do is give away three free accesses to the Express Entry complete step-by-step -step course to doing it yourself. So I'm going to give away three. And all you have to do is be the first three people uh, to tell me, dun, 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 what is this castle and where is it located? 
All right, so that's the question. All you have to do is just go right here. <laughs> I've got my mic hanging out here. Go here, post in the comment section the name of this, this castle and where it's located. All right, and I think that's what I'm gonna probably start doing a little bit more. I won't always ask the same question because people will be jumping the gun. But uh, Ralph Hansky has said yes, so we're watching after his last comment. I want you to, uh, the first three people that post where this castle is located will uh, will be awarded. Boy, Kabir says Alberta. <laughs> that would be awesome if Alberta uh, Patel says Calgary. You guys are awesome. Maximus is close. He's got Germany, but you got to name. You have to name the castle. So the first three people to name the castle, what the castle is is called, or where it's specifically located. Okay. So we've got a, some people that are getting close. <laughs> Lots of Calgary guys. No, nah, it's not. <laughs> so anyway, so we'll let that all play itself out as people are trying to figure out where this castle is located. So. Um, that's the, that'll be a little fun game. The first three people that have the correct, the first three correct answers, Igor is going to screen it for me. We'll have an opportunity to get a free access to the, uh, express entry. And I'll, I'll show you what I'm referring to here to this. If I can find the right page right there, right here, this awesome little guide. And I'm going to just log in here quick, I think for myself. And I'll show you what it is for those who are new to this and just tuning in. Um, right here is my express entry complete step by step. At one time I called it a guide and it still is kind of referenced as a guide, but it's really a course. It's a full course that with videos, tutorials on every section of, of express entry, how it works, um, the how to prepare to submit your express entry profile. There's videos on um, the actual... Uh, eligibility requirements and like I said both the profile and the EAPR and a whole section devoted to documents and my favorite right here is the document checklist which contains a whole list of downloadable resources here on the right side everything from reference letters to to gift deeds to um, all of the things that I do is with all of my clients I'm, I'm providing here to subscribers as a resource and we're thinking about spinning those out into different formats but right now um, that's something that yeah I'm really really proud of that one in particular and then for those of you who say oh Mark this is just general stuff well all of these videos if you're trying to sift through and get the answers it's taking you wow I, I shudder to think how long it's taking you to try to find the answer you're looking for in a video that lasts an hour to hour and a half. So what I've done instead is we've broken it all down, the best information, the best instructions, the best content, and included it in sections. So general information, we've got work experience. All of these are related to work experience. How do I prove work experience if I'm self-employed? That's a popular one. We've got language, we've got Express entry, um, the eligibility section, job offers, what they are, um, proof of funds, police clearances, dependent family members. I even have a special series on how to fill out the forms if you're listing your spouse as non-accompanying in your EAPR. And, uh, and so there's all of these things that are all available and it just goes on and on and on. So that is the course. That's what we're giving away for free. And I can definitely see some correct answers there. Uh, New Schwanstein <laughs> Castle, Germany. That is the correct answer, guys. So uh, I'll let Igor choose and, and notify the, the winners. Uh, congratulations. That was a little bit of fun. But hey, we need to have some fun, right? This stuff, you know, if we're always talking about doom and gloom, well, uh, it's not very an enjoyable video. So at this stage, I want to, it looks like we've got uh, sufficient answers now. So thank you to all of you guys that have. Um, uh, that have uh, responded correctly. And I guess now, everyone, we're at the stage where let's talk about immigration. So we'll turn the time over now to those who are posting questions. So it looks like a Diamond here with the correct answer, although we don't think he made the cut for the first three, uh, did have the correct answer there. And so anyone who posts comments after Diamond here, I will start answering those. Um, what else do we have going on here? Well, one of the things while we're waiting for those comments to be posted, um, once again, I want to extend a sincere, heartfelt uh, concern and thoughts and prayers to all of you all over the world 
who are suffering in various ways because of this virus. And I, you know, as I was reading the reports now, we're starting to see the coronavirus get into some of our seniors' extended care facilities where our, where our, our elderly um, live. And you know, my mother, she's independent. She, she lives in an apartment, but it's a seniors' complex, so only seniors live there. And all it takes is one person to bring it in, and, and they're the most susceptible. And so I'm always worried. I'm always stressed. And I, as I watch and see the reports in the U.S., as, as the numbers of infections have just expanded drastically, and I watch all of the countries that are so hard hit, Iran, Italy, Spain, and you know, the list really is way, way larger than that, um, just how this virus is affecting all of our lives. My heart goes out to those who, who have their own businesses that have been forced to close uh, temporarily, hopefully, that can somehow find a way to, to um, reopen after all of this, this craziness is, is done. Uh, but it's going to have a drastic impact on all of us globally. So my heart goes out to all of you. I know, you know, personally as a small business owner myself, I, I, I fully understand. I'm so fortunate that I have the ability to work out of my home. And this is a decision that I made back in December to make my law firm virtual. And, you know, I don't know what kind of divine inspiration that was or, or just dumb luck, but um, I felt really strongly that I needed to do that. And now I'm so just unbelievably grateful because we're doing some things that are going to help to insulate us and to help us be able to continue um, providing us an extremely valuable service, answering your questions, helping you guys through these these uncharted waters, which I've referenced on many occasions. And so thank you so much for everyone, for all of your support and our, our best, you know, heartfelt wishes and prayers and thoughts go out to all of you who may be suffering temporally or physically or even spiritually or, or emotionally because of, you know, this isolation that we're all put under. So we're all big one community, no matter where you live in the world. And uh, we're all in this together. Okay, let's jump over and let's take a look and see what we have here. All right. So, um, <clears throat> okay. Ralph says, yeah, we've got the, the YouTube button to subscribe. Thanks. Yes, we do. So yeah, all those social media channels, go subscribe and follow the one that you're accustomed to following. We'll try to find you there. Okay. Kabir says, can a person be denied PR even after receiving a confirmation of permanent residence? Can the CBSA deny entry on the first landing? Please advise. Thank you. Well, Kabir, they can always deny. So the, the, just because you have a confirmation of permanent residence does not mean you're a permanent resident yet. You actually have to complete the landing process. Now, what that looks like these days is still, um, is, is still being determined, especially for people who are in Canada who, and they, we are counseled now no longer to do any applications, um, what we call flag polling of Canadians or I should say people who are in Canada who now have received their confirmation of permanent residence, you are specifically instructed not to go to the border and they will not facilitate you there. Um, you have to wait for instructions and they're going to be calling out and trying to do this in an orderly fashion. They're still working through it. As of last Tuesday, two days ago, like I said, um, they have not yet uh, explained what they're going to be doing, but stay tuned in the coming weeks. So, um, for you, those of you who are outside of Canada and see your confirmation of permanent residence with an expiry date that's expiring, you have the ability to send a web form to indicate that you're not going to be able to travel because of no flights or border closures or what they may be, but there is going to be flexibility. There's going to be grace periods. But I do want to emphasize, Kabir, that the same old rules always apply. If you get to the border and you're, you're flying into Canada or driving across the land border from the U.S. and you have been issued a nomination from the province of Prince Edward Island and you are traveling into Alberta because I've told you how awesome this amazing province is and everybody wants to move there. Um, <laughs> one of the funny things, guys, is I, I've been joking that uh, all of my clients and everybody that follows in our 125,000, just shy of 125,000 uh, member uh, Express Entry Law private Facebook group, I jokingly said, hey, let's see if we can skew the government stats by everybody saying that they're going to be moving to Lethbridge, Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, they they use that for statistical purposes, and you can imagine, hey, it would it would result in a whole bunch of benefits maybe coming to Lethbridge because of all these immigrants who say they're going to be moving to Lethbridge. But I'm just kind of doing that a little bit tongue in cheek. But boy, that would be hilarious. So if it says where you're going to live, 
understand you don't have to live there unless you are a provincial nominee. And so if you, back to the, the original discussion, Kabir, if you land at the airport in Calgary, you've got a Prince Edward Island nomination and you say, I'm going to be living in Lethbridge uh, because Mark says that city is the best in all of Canada. The officer at that stage could very well refuse to land you and refer you back or refer your file back for reconsideration uh, for failing to demonstrate that you have an intention um, to reside in the province that nominated you. So, and it goes the opposite way too. There's a provision within the general provisions of express entry, and I won't get into the specific legislation and the sections, but you have an obligation to demonstrate that you have an intention to reside outside of the province of Quebec for the general express entry provisions. So if you're showing up in Montreal as a general express entry person, say you're going to be living in Montreal, an, a, a border officer could turn it around at that stage. But I think, Kabir, for the question that you asked, the reality is, no, there's going to be, um, they're not just going to deny because, um, you know, for some reason of their own making. Now, they can always, always, um, uh, you know, uh, take steps to make sure that you are medically in it, that you're medically admissible to Canada, but border officers don't have the ability to do that. All they can do is uh, refuse to grant and then refer it for further examination. Um, but when it comes to COVID-19, that, that whole, uh, the virus and everything, yes, that's part of the whole process why Canada and all the countries in the world have closed their borders, but those types of things are not going to result in you losing your opportunity to become a permanent resident. Um, uh, you know, barring some exceptional circumstance where maybe, you know, because of the, the virus, you become um, ill in a way that would then require you to receive treatment and everything that would affect your medical admissibility. And I'm not going to get into all of that because the likelihood, excuse me, of those things happening and applying to any of you are so remote. But generally speaking, yeah, you're not going to have any issues. Okay, that was a great question, Kabir. I could probably take that question and I really should make these all uh, little videos in and of themselves um, just because of how, yeah, how good they are. And, uh, you know, the questions I mean, how good they are, not necessarily my answers. Okay, next one is Masood. And he says, Dear Mark, I've applied for my employer-specific work permit in January. I have a PNP under skill C and I have a P uh, and I have submitted my PR application as well. If I wish to take my wife along with me while I come to Canada on a work permit, um, am I eligible to apply for an open work permit for her? How can she um, basically combine her application with mine? Thank you for being such a great help. Okay, well, obviously this is a very, very narrow area. With skilled workers, um, you can always apply if you're obtaining a skilled work permit to have your spouse come with you based on PNP nominations. And you haven't quite indicated exactly uh, if it's the R204C letter, which is the letter that the provinces issue that say this person is urgently needed. Um, in those circumstances, at times, you can include a spouse, and uh, it, but, it, but you haven't given me enough information here to know which program or which specific uh, category your work permit is being issued under. Um, usually, if it's low skill, it's through one of these provincial territorial agreements that uh, Canada has with the provinces. Um, but when it comes to a, a spouse coming, generally speaking, they can't get open work permits if you're working in a low skill position. But with the PNPs and uh, some of the exemptions that exist for urgently required workers, uh, those spouses do have the ability to get it. But everything else applies, right? Right now, um, unless you're in an area of essential service, it's really, really um, unlikely that they're going to allow um, just anyone to come to Canada. They've indicated IRCC that uh, there is no specific restrictions on study permits, work permits. However, what we're seeing now with the other orders in council and with the restrictions on travel, that's where we're running into the problems and how those are being interpreted by the Canadian, by the Canada Border Service Agency and the airlines. Because understand, guys, that we have immigration, IRCC, they're, you know, for all intents and purposes, indicating it's, it's business as usual uh, in terms of their processing and the ability to apply for work permits. We're still waiting to see, um, uh, you know, exactly what's going to happen with express entry. I've been reaching out to my, my colleagues and we've been kind of trying to tap in. And at this stage, 
my feeling, and I know someone's going to ask it, will Express Entry, will they continue with the rounds of invitations? I'll get to the official answer, but I'm leaning to yes, but we just will have to wait and see. But for people in your specific situation, Masood, you have immigration that says um, if you're eligible to apply for a work permit, you can apply for it. Um, then there's the orders in council, which give specific instructions, which change all the time, which I'd encourage you to go back and review and take a look at yourself. I'm always leery to say specifically what it is today because someone might listen to it tomorrow and then it may have changed. So always go back to the links that we've provided for those information in the blog post, especially that Susan provided and uh, on the government website. And we'll be constantly tweeting and posting an Instagram and in stories and all these kinds of things. Um, um, just the most latest updated information that we can find. Okay. And then finally, we got the airlines making those decisions on who can board, who can't. And then finally, we have the CBSA who ultimately, you know, they waved the final, this final stick in terms of whether or not you're going to pass or not. And uh, sometimes their interpretations are not always consistent. Okay. And that's a whole nother podcast that I could probably do on, you know, the makeup of an officer and what it's like to be an officer trying to wear all these hats probably makes sense for me to do that. I think I will. Okay, Abhishek says, um, I am right now in Toronto on my postgrad work permit and I'm very fortunate to have been working my regular hours during these scary times. Abhishek, that is awesome. I will complete my one year of full-time work on May the 7th and therefore be eligible for CEC about 488. Okay, uh, every other document is ready to go. I'm just waiting to complete the full year. My question is if they stop the EE draws for now, and my postgrad work permit expires on June the 16th, what are my options? Is there any way I can extend my stay? Thanks. So Abhishek, this is one of the things that we're seeing time and time and time again. Now, I am leaning towards the, the fact that they're probably going to continue to issue. The challenge that many people will have right now is that you can't get an English test as it is right now. Um, at, you, you're unable in many cases, uh, even the educational credential assessments, Wes, is... is, is uh, is slowing down what they're doing. And I think they may even be suspended right now. And so those are the issues. So I personally feel like if they do rounds, that the comprehensive ranking score is going to drop in those rounds. And those of you who have been just hanging in there for the last year, hoping that you're going to have an opportunity, that already have your language tests, already have everything in place, you're just sitting waiting, but the score hasn't dropped down to 465 or 460. You watch, it may just do that because there isn't the same level of new candidates all flooding in to refill the pool at those higher levels above 470. So just watch it. Abhishek, I think you know you still have a lot of reason to be hopeful. Um, our position um, that we are going to be advocating for all Canadian immigration lawyers is, is that the government needs to keep going, not just to support our own livelihood, but we need to keep moving forward. Um, it doesn't change the fact, the virus doesn't change the fact of, of what's happening with our country and we will continue to need immigrants. You are the lifeblood of our country. All right, so moving forward here. Um, next question, this is uh, Harry. He says, hi Mark and Igor, hope you two are doing good and the best of health. Thanks Harry. Um, with, my, with the confirmation of permanent resident holders who will be landing in the coming weeks, um, will these confirm these COPR holders be eligible for any kind of financial benefits from the government or will they have to depend solely on proof of funds considering they won't be able to procure jobs anytime soon because of virus lockdown thanks in advance. Harry, there's no indication in these emergency measures um, that average individuals will not be able to, to benefit from them. Now remember, a lot of these measures are designed to, to help people who um, were already working and, and lost their jobs. And that's part of the article that we wrote in terms of EI that you can find, employment insurance that you can find on our, our website. And Igor did a great job at doing a lot of the legwork for this. And I'm just going to pull it up here. So if you go to our blog here, you'll see that we have two just released this week. We're trying to get these pumped out as quick as we can. Are foreign workers entitled to employment insurance benefits in Canada? And so we just kicked that one out yesterday. I think it's the second today. And so you can take a look at that. 
Um, but they're, right now, they're not distinguishing the difference between a foreign worker even and uh, a permanent resident and a citizen. But we don't know because the full details of these programs have not been released. Well, I should say employment insurance. Yeah, if you've been paying into it, yes, there are certain restrictions based on the kind of work permit you have and your current status. But um, but work permit holders um, may very well be eligible to submit uh, an application for employment insurance. And Igor did a great job of providing links and, and we cleaned it all up and made it really easy to read for you. Uh, but with the emergency measures, um, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens, Harry. Because even us, for Canadian citizens, we, we don't know how it's all going to play out. There's been lots of announcements, but not a lot of detail. Great question, Harry. All right. Okay, next is uh, Johanna. And she says, hi, Mark. I'm an international student in Vancouver with a delay in graduation. Will that affect my validity to stay in Canada since my permit expires in August 2020 and I cannot yet apply for a postgrad work permit? My son and husband also with me with student and work permits expiring contemporaneous with mine. So, Johanna, no, you have to be vigilant. You have to make sure that you're applying to extend. You're doing the things you need to. If graduation is delayed and you're going to have to continue into September, into the fall, for instance, um, and your, your study permit is expiring in August, then you're going to submit an application to extend that study permit. And the government is going to be fair. They, they, they are going to be reasonable. I have to assume they are because <laughs> that's the message that they've been giving to all of us. And so in your situation, um, just make sure that you don't let your status expire, that you apply to, uh, to extend in the proper way. And um, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to, you know, to any of you that have just need more information about things that are more specific. Um, you'll notice that I'll probably bypass your question if it's if it's only something that would benefit you and not every, anyone else. If it's something that's very specific, case specific to you, you need to book a paid consultation. And um, the, the best way to do that, once again, our site is the source of all goodness. You click on the start here button and then you work through exactly what your issue is. So you have the ability to start with individual immigration. Um, you can say, I want to enter or remain in Canada temporarily. I want to study in Canada. That then takes me to exactly where this person, for example, Joanna, may need help with extending her study permit. And then you can provide details and all that and send it. And that's the best way to go through. Paid consultations with me and uh, with our lawyers are $210. That includes only our 5% tax here uh, in Alberta uh, for a 25-minute consult. But don't be deceived because in that 25-minute consult, like we've already prepared for it, we're ready, and it's it's actually not us sitting here listening to you tell the story, but you've already provided information to us in advance and we hit the payment running. Those of you uh, past cons uh, people who've booked consults, just give a shout out in the comments. Let people know that it was actually worth your time. But <laughs> with that being said, if you felt it was a complete waste of money, I want you to also post that because I don't want to be here saying that something is really good if it isn't. Now, I believe that it's worth your time and worth every penny because it helps you to govern where you're going to go with your life. But that's a separate discussion. This isn't about plugging you to to hire us as your lawyers, uh, your immigration lawyers. The purpose here is to make sure that we're giving information that people can rely on and trust to not make mistakes that will destroy their chances of remaining in Canada temporarily or immigrating permanently to Canada. Okay, uh, next question is from Ronell. He says, one question again, Mark, related to my question last live um, Q&A. Currently, I applied for my last extension until my visa expiration on September 2020. Can I apply for a new TRV before September 2020? If yes, and given a new TRV um, through the online while I'm here in Canada, do I need to exit Canada or not? Thank you. If you have... If you have valid status, this is the key. If you're on a valid work permit here in Canada, you have the ability or study permit or whatever, valid status, and you've indicated here that your, your visa is expiring in September. I don't know what your status is in Canada. Um, you can't, um, if you're here on a visitor, they will often kick you out. So in other words, you, if you have a valid visitor record, yeah, that's fine. But if you don't have, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me describe this. They have the discretion as to whether or not they're going to allow you to apply for an extension to your temporary resident visa. If you have status in Canada, through usually a work permit and a study permit is the route that you do that, then you have the ability to apply inside Canada to extend your temporary resident visa. And remember, there's a distinction between a permit that allows you to do something in Canada, visit, uh, work, study, 
And there is the temporary resident visa that's imprinted in your passport for people that are coming from countries like India, for instance, where you have to have that visa imprinted in your passport in order to board the plane. So um, that TRV extending at Renell really depends upon what your status is in Canada. And um, if you are on a work permit, then yes. If, you're, if your work permit is expiring in September of 2020, they may question whether or not they're going to extend your temporary resident visa. So it all comes down to your status in Canada. Okay, hopefully uh, that answered that question. Um, okay, next question is Patel. He says, I have applied for a study permit. It's been a month, but no update. Um, uh, let's see, no update. May intake is near what to do. Well, the reality is everything is being delayed. So yes, it's business as usual in terms of their intention to continue processing. And they have confirmed that with us. But when it comes to timing, there's no guarantee that they're going to be able to meet any of the posted timelines that they have within their stated processing times. And we know that. You know, we just looked last video at Igor when he came in. Um, he had his PR cards for him and his wife um, uh, sent to our address because they didn't have an address yet when they landed. And it took, I think, Igor, you can remind me, but it, it seemed like it was, it was almost seven weeks or, or eight weeks maybe that it was maybe not quite eight, but it was, I think it was six or seven weeks before we actually got them. And on the, the website, it says, you know, just, a, it says right around two weeks to get your PR card. So understand that those processing times are all gonna be in flux. They're probably gonna try to update them as well as they can, but with limited staff, people working virtually, you know, they're not accustomed to people dealing with your sensitive information out of their homes. And to set up those security procedures and to allow people to work virtually is not easy. So they're traditionally have always been working in a center. And um, the processing centers in Canada, the consulates abroad, um, but they're always kind of in those centers doing the work um, where the information is secured and locked down. And, uh, and now that's, you know, there's some that can't work, some that have to be home because of uh, self-isolation. So that's all going to impact what's happening. It all will. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, An says, what is your expectation next draw? Will be CEC specific or will it be regular draw? Uh, Ian, I don't know. I'm going to say it's going to be a regular draw. And I, my view is that it's probably going to drop a little bit. That's my view. Okay. Um, okay. So Diamond's got a question here. Hi, Mark. If someone's PR, the Canadian experience class was declined because of foreign work experience, wrong knock. Ugh. Ah, uh, boy, I, I swear probably 40% of the consultations that I do are people that tried to do it themselves for every reason, every reasonable reason in the world. Because you read on the internet, you read the government, it says specifically that you don't need to hire anyone to help you. There's so many helpful friends out there and people, um, you know, consultants, uh, um, you know, these agents overseas who are all putting out their own videos. Heck, there's the expert who immigrated themselves and has all the answers that are telling people what to do and what to expect. And it's a freaking disaster is the only way I can describe it. And so I'm not surprised, Diamond, that that, that may have happened to someone. I'm not saying it's you, but to someone. So the wrong knock. IRCC says she can reapply uh, though she is still in Canada with a new profile. So can she leave out the foreign work experience and just use Canadian if she gets above the CRS cutoff? Will IRCC ask about the former applicant's foreign work experience? Great question, actually, Diamond. You can fix anything you want when you resubmit a new profile. But remember, the previous one was all a part of your immigration history. So an officer can go back and say, well, Diamond listed this work history before and now they're not listing it. But understand you have no obligation to list any work history in your work history section that you're not claiming comprehensive ranking system points for or for which you wish to be included uh, within your federal skilled worker or your CEC, those two federal immigration programs or federal skilled trade for that matter, um, eligibility. And so, yes, you absolutely can leave it out of your work history and just rely on your Canadian if that gives you a score that's high enough, but you must 100% list it in your personal history section of everything that you've done. Now, when you list it in that personal history section, it's not going to require you to, to obtain reference letters or anything like that, or even identify a knock. You're just including it in there and it doesn't form a part of that actual eligibility assessment or the ranking system, okay? 
great question, Diamond. And once again, I think all of you know, well, you know what, I'm going to show you because I think you can click on our website and click on price. We offer what I call um, a, a client-centered firm supported model. And we don't want to be filing your application through our rep portal. In fact, what we want to do is we want to work directly with you to review everything together in a collaborative fashion, just like this video where I'm sharing my screen. And so I just want to show you. So for express entry, this is what we charge. We charge $3,000 Canadian, which when I look at what other people are charging and the service that they offer for that fee, oh my goodness, I'll hold up what our awesome firm does against anyone there in the world. We work di directly with you in a collaborative fashion. And uh, so that's something that I love to do with my clients, especially individuals like you, uh, Diamond, who have gone through the process, already had one refusal, and you've got to deal with a bunch of stuff. You have to deal with making sure this time, which may or may not be your last kick at that can, it may be your last opportunity. And for many people who book consults with me, they really only had one shot. And when they got it wrong because they had the wrong knock, sometimes they're done. And they just their their opportunity and dream of coming to Canada is gone. And immigration, like IRCC, does not say that anywhere. You know, no one, they they anyone on inter, internet land who says, oh, you can do it yourself, no big deal, you don't need any help, um, you can just do it yourself. Uh, none of them are saying, but if you get it wrong, your whole plan of coming to Canada could be could be totally crushed. And um, it's because I knew that people, not everyone in the world, can even afford three thousand dollars which I think is probably one of, on the lower end of anyone doing express entry these days. Um, that's why I created the express entry complete step-by-step -step course for doing it yourself. And that's why I price it the way it is. And I wish I could show you guys, like I, it, it doesn't, it doesn't do justice for me to blither on about this stuff. I know that you guys are like, stop talking, Mark, just answer my question. I don't want to hire you, blah, 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 whatever. Fine. I don't care. But, but I want you to understand that this, this course that I've created here, is a step-by-step, -step, every aspect of it, pointing out the most common areas where people screw up. And those common areas where people screw up are the same areas where people book consultations and pay me $200 plus $10 for sales tax, 210 for a 25 minute consult. And for, I just gave you guys the code, <laughs> EEDIY50, you can get access to this full course to walk you through everything, including sample documents, everything, for that 248.50 or whatever whatever it is for you watching live. For the regular person, they have to pull, uh, pay full rate. But if you use that coupon code that I showed you, you can access it at a fraction of that cost. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about that any further. <laughs> but understand, boy, it's such, I, I just breaks my heart when people for a few hundred dollars, they could get all the resources that they need to go for and do it. now. Obviously, it doesn't include every single possible nuance, but that's why we're here for, for consults to fill in those gaps. But it gives you one place where you can go, a source to help you do it. And just watch the testimonials that are everywhere. Um, okay, moving forward. Okay, so yes, the first three correct answers were Jazdeep, uh, Bochti, and Wasim Ahmed. Congratulations. If you three characters have already... Um, one, uh, and I'm, I can't remember if Jazdeep, you've already won, or Wasim. If any of you guys have previously won a free access, um, let's let someone else have an opportunity to win. <laughs> and so I can't remember. I know you guys are pretty quick at the draw. Okay, Mohammed says, uh, hello, Mark. I hope you're fine and doing well. I have a query regarding post landing. As my wife is the primary applicant and I'm an accompanying spouse, after landing in Canada, hopefully Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. Uh, do the primary applicant really need to open a bank account? And is it mandatory that the primary applicant that she must do a job? Is it affecting our case when we're applying for citizenship after a certain period? Thanks. Understand, guys, that um, when you become permanent residents, you know, you can do whatever the heck you want. You're not obligated to open a bank account. You know, you're not obligated to work. Although you will need to provide for yourself and those settlement funds probably won't last very long. But the, the reality is if she's the principal applicant and you, Muhammad, are going to be the principal breadwinner, the, the, the principal um, income earner for your family, that's totally fine. There's no problems at all. But make sure, make sure that you consistently always file your taxes because those taxes that you file 
um, are some of the evidence that immigration looks for um, when you're trying to sponsor a parent or a grandparent, when you're applying for citizenship. And it's also a very clear indicator as well that you're in Canada for the purposes of a, res a residency determination when you're extending your PR card if you haven't yet applied for citizenship. So don't take any chances and make sure that you do always file your taxes and be honest and um, you're not going to have any issues regardless with who works after you get permanent residence. Okay. Um, all right. So the next one here, uh, Maximus says, Hey Mark, I'd like to find out if Express Entry Draw will happen in April. Any predictions? My profile expires by the 11th of April. Oh, Maximus, I'm really sorry about that. Um, hopefully it's just because of the one year and you can go back in and you've still got your language and you can re-enter it. Um, but yeah, we just don't know. At this stage, there's lots of rumblings that it, that it should go forward, but there's been no um, no firm confirmation. So at least on Tuesday, they when, when we had our discussion, um, they're still thinking about it. And there's so much that they have to think about it. And I want to give a huge shout out to all of the the heads of immigration, even the head of our country. And understand, I am a conservative by persuasion. That's I'm an Alberto, so what do you expect? But I have been very impressed with the way our government has been, you know, doing what they're doing. Um, they've been, you know, they've been they've been doing their best. And these are horribly difficult times. And um, I, I throw out the whole political stuff. Who cares at this stage? The most important thing is that we are doing what's in the best interest of our country. And a huge, massive shout out to um, to our healthcare system, all of those healthcare workers, all of the health ministers, everything across all of Canada that are doing the very best in such difficult times. And we have an amazing, amazing healthcare system. And that's the shining light. That's the thing that we are so proud of as Canadians. And uh, and that's what makes Canada so much more attractive than so many other countries. And I'll tell you, including the US, they can have all their wonderful economic opportunities, but take a look now, right? How equipped are they to be able to deal with this? And, you know, it's hard to watch anyone, any country go through the numbers of, of infected people in cases uh, of people that are suffering. It's hard to watch any country. Uh, but I'll tell you, I, I match our health system up to theirs and I'll take ours hands down over and over and over again. And um, yes, I have less money in my pocket than maybe some of my American friends, but I feel very, very confident that our system is going to be able to care for the people that become ill. And as long as we're doing what we're supposed to do and trying to self-isolate and, and keep ourselves distant from one another, that this storm will pass and it will, the, the, the limited or most limited number of people um, uh, will die because of it. Okay, moving forward, Rura. Hello, Rura. Uh, Rura says, please answer my email. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, how about I answer your question right here? <laughs> so, uh, so answering your comment, Rura, um, regarding maternity leave and continuous work experience. If I have four years experience, but in between there's maternity leave for two months, so does these four years consider as continuous or not? Please answer me. I've sent you an email and I have your, your do-it-yourself guide and I still am able to answer this question by myself. Thank you very much. Rura, it all comes down to the eligibility requirements for either the Canadian Experience class or the Federal Skilled Worker Program. So breaks in time, um, they are determinative and the impact of those depends upon which program you're qualified under. So let's address the Canadian Experience class first. I won't delve into the Federal Skilled Worker Program, sorry, the Federal Skilled Trade Program, because it's just so rare and so few people deal with that. If you have specific questions about that, book a consult, happy to answer it. But in your case, Rura, let's say you're CEC. If you're a Canadian Experience class, you just have to show that you meet that one year of, um, of skilled work experience in the three-year period immediately preceding the day that you apply. And in this case, it's when you file your EAPR. And um, well, the reality is at the time you submit your profile is really when that assessment takes place. But you can accumulate that in bits and pieces regardless of any breaks, and it's all going to be counted. So under the CEC, you've got tremendous flexibility. The two-month mat leave is irrelevant. Under the Federal Skilled Worker Program, 
there is an obligation to um, to work continuously in that foreign work experience for at least a year. That's the bare minimum. And if you can meet the eligibility requirements for the federal skilled worker program with just that one year, then it doesn't matter. You can have a break and then count other years towards your comprehensive ranking system score. That continuity isn't a isn't a binding requirement for the comprehensive ranking system score that you're given with an express entry. But the continuity must be in the same NOC, the same occupation, um, and must be continuous to count those work experience points under the eligibility criteria of the federal skilled worker program, which is really what you're eligible for. That's what allows you to go into the, the pool. So hopefully that answers your question, Rura. Good question, really good. How are we doing for time? Wow, we're already at an hour and we hardly even got through these. Okay, well, let's see here. We'll ask, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can wrap up one more here. Um, okay, we'll do, I'll, I'll do three more and then I have to shut this off at an hour. So the next one is Bezat. He says, thank you for answering our questions. I'm holding a work permit and have been working for a company in Ottawa since October, 2019. I've been temporarily laid off due to the business closure, but I'll definitely have my position after the company starts again. In this period, while I'm receiving EI, still considered as my work experience if my employer confirm it in my employment letter. Um, no, Bezad, you can't count it as work history if you're not actually performing the duties and working. You're being laid off, you are technically still employed, but um, they're gonna, immigration is not gonna accept that as, as work experience if you've actually been laid off. And it's, that's, it's as simple as that. Okay. Um, Okay, Simar says, hello Mark, could you tell me information please about New Brunswick PNP? I've created a profile, I'm waiting for an ITA, but I need some information about the process and the time required for it and also how this province proceeds with the application. Okay, so when it comes to the eligibility for the various provincial nominee programs, these suckers change all the time. And so what might be in existence when I do this video now, in a week's time, they could close the program, cancel it, change it. These are all creatures of policy, not uh, act, not regulations, not legislation. Excuse me. So because of that, it's really difficult to give anyone uh, direction and advice. But you here, when it comes to tell me uh, about the program, you know, there are a bunch of different programs. There are different categories. There's in Canada, there's outside, and it's just right now, in a live q a is probably not the best use of time to go through the ins and outs of the new brunswick pnp however it would be a good topic for one of my upcoming um canadian immigration podcasts and you'll go back and you can watch those and generally speaking i always invite guests on from all across the country and i think it would make sense to invite someone from new brunswick to come back on to talk a little bit about the pnp but uh, for this, CMAR, I can't really go into too much detail with you, buddy, other than advise you to go to the website and read the instructions. Okay, Cheetan says, how is the employment economy situation for new PRs arriving in Canada? Is the Canadian experience even more important now? Do you know what, Cheetan? At the end of the day, the most important thing is who wants to work. And um, we know that there are industries that have traditionally always been ones that Canadians don't want to work in. So as far as the economy and as far as your employability when you come, it really comes down to your own unique skills, your background, your language, your education. And um, in some industries, it is more difficult to kind of crack that, that glass ceiling, I guess, if you will, or, or being able to get into, uh, you know, because Canadian experience is valued so much. But I can tell you, every bit as much as Canadian experience is your ability to communicate in English, your ability to to learn and adapt uh, to the way business is done in Canada, and um, and so that's a tough one to answer. Um, but I like to think that everybody has a fair shake, and uh, but clearly in this economy, if we have thirty percent of our Canadian population that's out of work, they're probably going to stoop down and do jobs that they normally wouldn't have done to be able to provide for their family. So we'll have to see how this all plays out. We definitely will. Okay. Joda says, after nominated from the province, if IELTS expired, then what a person have to do in express, uh, express profile? Will his nomination expire as well? Or a person can give IELTS again and submit an EE profile? Okay. So if you have received your nomination and your, your IELTS has expired before you get an ITA, 
um, you, you absolutely have to get the IELTS test done again. So if your IELTS is expired and you submit, um, you're, you're not going to be able to submit your, your profile if your IELTS is expired. Like, so you, you might, um, your, your, your profile is going to, um, it's going to be canceled if your IELTS expires. And I'm, I'm wondering if maybe it has already happened. Um, usually when, uh, a, when um, your language, uh, the expiry date, uh, in, in the case of language, it's two years. So if your IELTS has expired, it's likely that your profile will be canceled, even if you have that nomination from the province. So you need to have that test taken again. And I know how hard it is right now because the tests are just simply, you can't take them right now. They're working hard to figure out an alternative. But at this stage, yeah, you could be in a difficult position. So Joda, you may want to reach out and just book a consult. We can kind of sort through that, but that's a tough one. Okay, Diamond says, thanks, Mark, for your comment. Okay, um, Bonica says, are they still providing LMIAs in this scenario? Yeah, they are. They absolutely are. And, but obviously uh, an employer still needs to demonstrate that there is a shortage of Canadians to do the job. And right now, that's a pretty hard sell. Uh, that's pretty tough. Okay. All right, guys, we had an awesome EE Live. Well, it wasn't an EE Live, was it? It was an immigration live Q&A. Hopefully the answers that were given today were helpful. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. It, it, you know, your questions, your participation makes all the difference in the world. Congratulations to the three people who won the, um, the one-time access or the uh, ability, the one-time payment, I should say, option for free to my Express Entry uh, complete step-by-step -step course to doing it yourself. And so congratulations to you. Thanks to everybody who's participated from all over the world. We had people from everywhere today, which was really cool. I think we pretty much hit on every continent except Antarctica. <laughs> but uh, wishing you guys all safety, um, health, that this coronavirus uh, you know, situation we're in right now will pass quickly and that you and your families will be protected. Um, sending love from all of the team here at Healthy Immigration Law. Remember, you can go back to our site. All of the information that we've talked about, a lot of it here can be found in, um, in our blog posts. If you click on the blog here right on our site, healthylaw.com. And within there, we are constantly updating this information. And check us out everywhere else on the internet, everywhere else in social media. We're now hitting on locations everywhere. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day. And uh, we'll stay tuned. Right now, we're looking at next Tuesday. Um, but I want to advise everybody as we're wrapping up, I am now uh, attending regular meetings um, with IRCC and the different government bodies on behalf of the Canadian Bar Association. And those meetings um, are seem to be hitting right at the same time that I'm supposed to do my EE Live Q&A and what's now become the Immigration Live Q&A on the Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page right here. I usually do those at noon on Tuesdays. But now make a special note and we'll try to advise people those are going to start at 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time Tuesday. All right. So thanks so much, guys. Wishing you all the best. Health, safety, happiness. And uh, yeah, just <laughs> all the best trying to navigate this crazy world that now we're faced with because of coronavirus. Take care.